Well, hello, hope everyone is doing well. This is the second video of three on Dante's Inferno. And because there's so much material in the Inferno, there's so much to talk about, all I can do in these videos really is try to um, orient you and try to um, open your eyes to uh, important dimensions of the Inferno. And really, there's, there's just one dimension of the Inferno that I want to talk about in this video. And it's related to the first discussion forum question. If you haven't already looked at the discussion forum questions, go ahead and do that. And I would make a habit of that um, every week, whether it's an essay or whether it's discussion forum questions. Go ahead and look at the essay prompt or the discussion forum questions at the beginning of the week, even if it's going to be a couple of days before you start working on it. You have the question in your mind. It then becomes a lens through which you read, and that better prepares you to answer either in a discussion post or in an essay. So I'm going to talk about the second discussion forum question in just a moment, but for now let me mention the first one. The first one has to do with the fact that Dante's Inferno is, in fact, hierarchical. It's hierarchical in the sense that sins that are punished in lower circles or sub-circles are regarded by Dante to be worse, um, more destructive than sins that uh, are punished higher in the Inferno. Um, and so the question that I want you to answer is, um, what's one example, well, and you could mention a second example if you'd like, but what's at least one example of a, um, a ranking of sins that Dante gives us that you would modify in some way? Um, so um, you need to offer at least one example, even if, you know, even if your own pr particular view is all sins are equally heinous in the eyes of God, that's fine, but you've got to get medieval for a moment. You've got to get in that medieval mindset that there are some sins that are worse than others, if that is in fact the case, and you just play along, even if you don't believe that. If that's the case, then how might you rank some of the sins differently from Dante? So I'll be very eager to hear what you have to say about that. Um, what I want to talk about in this video is, is mainly what the organizing principle of the hierarchy of sins is in the Inferno. And then I'll talk about a couple of examples of groups of sinners who don't quite neatly fit into this hierarchy. Uh, by the way, I would certainly encourage you, if you haven't already, to go ahead and print out this particular handout, which just is a nice kind of visual reminder of who is where in the Inferno. Now, it's in Canto 11. Maybe you're there already, maybe you're not, but it's in Canto 11 that there's a kind of sidebar in which Virgil explains to Dante why sinners are grouped the way that they are in the Inferno. And it becomes clear, and you can see this on the handout if you look over to the left-hand margin, that there are three major categories of sin in Dante's mind. Um, I will talk about those categories in just a second. For now, I just want to point out the interesting fact that Dante is getting these categories from Aristotle. And Virgil is quite clear about this in Canto 11. I mention that only because I think it's a very good example of how in the medieval mind, the minds of people like Dante or from an earlier century, somebody like Thomas Aquinas, how they believed that scripture and philosophy, philosophy at its best, I mean, philosophy is not infallible, but philosophy at its best is in fact compatible with scripture. Okay, there's a kind of fundamental harmony. So if you look at what scripture teaches about ethics and morality, and you look at the very best of pagan philosophy, um, Aristotle, for example, perhaps Plato, you'll find a, a deep 
uh, congruity between uh, the two. So I just want to point that out. All right, well, according to um, Aristotle, and hence according to Dante as well, the first category of sin and the sort of the least um, destructive category of sin is uh, the sins of incontinence. Well, incontinence is not a word that we use in our everyday language, probably. Um, a sin of incontinence, we, we might say, is a sin where we lose self-control. Our appetites, our impulses get the better of us. Okay? Um, so um, sins of incontinence are sins that occur because our appetites are not controlled. Now, one thing that you'll notice if you look at the sins of incontinence, fornication, gluttony, greed, anger, um, the desire for um, the particular object is not in itself sinful, right? So nothing intrinsically wrong with the desire for food. Okay? It's only when that desire becomes uncontrolled and turns into gluttony that there's a problem. There's not even necessarily a problem with anger per se. After all, Jesus himself became angry in the Gospels. The problem is when the anger is not controlled. And we could say the same thing uh, about sex even, um, as well as uh, greed, right? It's not wrong to desire basic material necessities. It's not wrong to desire a roof over your head um, or something like that. But um, if that appetite sort of becomes out of control, then, then we have a problem, okay? So um, that, that's what the sins of incontinence have in common. Now, that being said, of course, even within these three major categories, there are rankings, right? So um, isn't it interesting that according to Dante, the least problematic sin of all is fornication, okay? whereas uh, anger is the most problematic of the sins of incontinence. And I think sometimes when you read Dante, you realize, even though some of us may claim that we don't really rank sins, that we think sins are equally offensive to God, I think sometimes when we read Dante, we realize Actually, we do kind of rank sins because we rank them differently from Dante. So um, just kind of be paying attention to that and always be thinking about the logic of it, right? Uh, why would Dante put um, angry sinners in a lower uh, level of hell than fornicators, somebody who committed adultery even? Um, that should, I think, strike us as slightly odd, but I think there's always a logic to it. All right. Um, then we come to the second major category, which uh, is the sin of violence. And, of course, this is a sin that can take a number of different forms. And you'll notice that within the seventh circle, there are three sort of sub-circles. Okay? And, again, the principle of hierarchy is still in place. Those that are in the third ring of the seventh circle, those sins are in some way worse than sins of the first ring of the seventh circle, and so on. Um, so violence, what, what makes violence worse than incontinence? I mean, that's the first question we have to ask, because clearly that's what Dante believes. Uh, and by the way, let me just point this out so that there's no uh, ambiguity about this. Dante is very clear that any of these sins, even the lighter sins, sins of incontinence, any of these sins will land you in hell for eternity. Okay, so he's not making light of any of these sins, but he does believe that some sins are worse than others, and that is very much in keeping, as I said, with his uh, medieval mentality. Well, what makes violence worse than incontinence? I, I think it goes back to what I said just a moment ago. Um, the sins of incontinence begin with desires that are not in and of themselves sinful. The desire for sex, the desire for food, and so on. But sins of violence um, are different, right? The, the very desire 
to commit an act of violence, whether it's against oneself, whether it's against another, whether it's against God, that very impulse is in itself disorder, sinful, wrong. And I think we could also add that um, in, in many cases, I guess this isn't the true in the case of suicide, um, but violence in, in most cases um, inflicts harm on others. And of course, that is really true of suicide as well, right? You're only committing violence against yourself, but of course, uh, many other people are going to be hurt by this act. That's a little bit different than, say, a sin like gluttony, where you could argue uh, most of the damage you're doing is to yourself. So that's another way of thinking about it. Finally, we come to the third and most base type of sin. These are sins of fraud or malice um, or malicious fraud, however you want to think about it. And again, what makes fraud or malice worse than violence? Well, I think the main answer that Dante has is that sins of fraud or malice are sins that involve the whole self. Okay? Um, I think we all know from experience, right, that you can um, commit a sin like gluttony even though your mind is kind of resisting, right? You know you shouldn't be making that third trip to the ice cream bar, but you do it anyway because your appetites are, are disordered. Um, but sins of malice or fraud require the full assent and cooperation of the mind. So it's not just a matter of disordered appetites. Um, it, the whole person is involved. And along with that, um, that means that the sins of this type are the only ones, uh, or let me put this differently, only human beings are capable of these sins. The other sins, um, animals, non-human animals are capable of, but only human beings can truly be malicious. Um, and I think that's important, right? So the, the, the most noblest part of us, the mind, the intellect, becomes corrupt when you commit an act of uh, malicious fraud in a way that uh, does not occur when you give in to lust or you give in to gluttony uh, or, or what have you. Um, now, you'll notice when you get to this section towards the end of the Inferno that the sins of malicious fraud actually comprise two circles of hell, circles eight and nine. Therefore, in Dante's mind, there are two types of malicious fraud. One is worse than the other, right? That, you know, this is the logic of the Inferno. The sins punished in circle nine are worse than the sins punished in circle eight. And uh, he talks about this on uh, page 86, at least of, uh, of the uh, assigned edition. Dante talks about simple versus compound forms of fraud. Um, fraud is always bad because you're defrauding another human being, and um, we, are, we are connected to all other human beings by the bond of nature. And we violate that bond when we commit an act of malicious fraud. So that's considered simple fraud because you're, you're violating that one bond of nature. Even worse are sins of compound fraud. These are sins where you commit an act of malice against someone with whom you have a, a relationship in addition to our relationship our basic relationship as members of the same human species, right? So when you defraud a family member, or when you defraud a master, or you defraud uh, your countrymen or something like that, not only are you violating um, the, the bond that we share as human beings, but you're breaking yet an additional bond as well. So those sins are even worse. Now, I suggested at the beginning of the video that there are a couple of categories of sinners that just don't quite fit into this threefold scheme. So let me mention those briefly. First of all, um, you'll notice, and hopefully if you haven't gotten to this part, you will very soon, 
that yes, hell has nine circles, but in addition to those nine circles, there's, there's a vestibule, there's a lobby of hell. And the people who are punished there are sinners who were mercenaries. They're not literally necessarily in the sense of um, soldiers for hire, but mercenary in the sense that they didn't really take any side. They didn't really have any principles. They really didn't take a stand. Uh, they simply worked on behalf of whoever rewarded them the most. So they never really chose sides. They only followed their self-interest. So these are people who aren't really for God or for Satan. They're only for themselves. And you'll notice um, the punishment that's inflicted on these soulless souls. They are running around naked. They are being chased by a swarm of wasps and bees. Um, blood and pus is running from their bodies onto the ground where it is swallowed by maggots. You'll notice that Dante is not for the squeamish. He, he likes the really graphic image. Now, I mention this not just to be uh, gratuitously gross, but I mention this because right from the very beginning of the Inferno, we see uh, what's going to be a pattern. We see the principle of reciprocal punishment. Reciprocal punishment means that sinners in hell are not just being punished in some sort of arbitrary way, um, but their punishment fits the crime in some way. Some, in some way, the, the punishment um, symbolizes the nature of the sin they committed. So in every case, when you come across a group of sinners and you see the way that they're being punished, you need to ask the question, why that particular punishment? Why is that particular punishment fitting for suicides or fitting for blasphemers or pimps or whatever? And um, so I can't do that for you every time, but let me just uh, walk you through this particular example because we see this here in the vestibule of hell as well. So first of all, what to do about the fact that these sinners are always sort of running around? They never stand in the same place. Well, I've already kind of hinted at this, right? They never actually take sides. They never take a stand. They're always just following whoever they think will reward them the most. So it's fitting, it's appropriate that in hell, they never take a stand. They never, they don't stay in the same place. They're constantly sort of on the run. Then you've got the wasp and the hornets. What, are, what is that supposed to represent? And by the way, let me make it clear, okay? This is, this is literature, this is not chemistry. So there's not necessarily you know, one right answer for all of these questions. This is part of the beauty of literature is that there's an element of open-endedness. But I think one possibility certainly would be that the wasps represent um, conscience, right? They're, 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 they're stung by their conscience because they know somewhere deep down that uh, being a mercenary is not really the right way to live. Um, it's also possible, too, that... Um, uh, you know, being run, uh, being chased about by, by wasps and hornets represents um, their sort of calculating non-commitment. Uh, they're always shifting their position because they think, oh, okay, well, uh, maybe if I if I work for this person uh, for this period of time, that will work out best for me. Um, so it could be that as well. But, you, but these are the kinds of questions you have to ask yourself, and you have to just kind of use your imagination in some cases. In some cases, I think it'll be pretty obvious what the symbolic significance of the punishment is. In other cases, it may be a little bit more enigmatic. And by the way, that uh, I, I said I'd come back to the second discussion forum question. Second discussion forum question of the week is, um, which particular punishment do you find to be really right on the money, uh, really symbolically rich and appropriate? So be thinking about that as you read. All right, there's uh, two other groups that don't fit neatly into this tripartite scheme that I've been describing. Um, I haven't said anything so far about the actual first circle of hell. 
The first circle of hell is not populated by people who committed sins of incontinence or violence or malicious fraud. Rather, there's a very different sort of reason why those folks are in that place. Circle one of hell is often called limbo. This is where Virgil, Dante's guide, lives. And um, in case it's not obvious, there's one very simple reason why someone would end up in limbo. I mean, uh, either people are in hell eternally, or they eventually make it to paradise eternally, or, and this is the only third option, uh, additional option for Dante, or they're in limbo, which is, yeah, part of hell uh, and on the one hand, but in other ways it doesn't quite fit. Um, you, you end up in limbo if you are a virtuous person, right? If you're not a virtuous person, you're going to end up in, in lower departments of hell. But if you're a virtuous person who lacks baptism, then you will wind up in limbo. Maybe permanently, maybe not. Limbo is where the Old Testament heroes went after they died. But um, during the time between Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus, according to Catholic tradition, descends into hell, and according to Dante anyway, goes to limbo, liberates you know, Abraham and Moses and all those folks, um, who then get to move on to paradise. Everybody else, though, um, has to stay behind. And as you read his description of limbo, it really stands out from all the other circles of hell. In some ways, it doesn't really seem hellish at all. There's even a moment when Dante is in limbo where Virgil smiles. And that's just like a little detail, and maybe... Maybe it's a throwaway detail, but to me that seems very significant, right? This is a very, very different kind of place than all the other lower circles of hell. So what makes it hell? I mean, that's, that's a real question. This is considered the first circle of hell. Um, I think you could probably kind of puzzle this out on your own, but I do want to point out that even though in many ways Virgil and the other residents of Limbo seem to be almost content with their lot. Nevertheless, there is a kind of gloom, Dante tells us, that encircles all of limbo. And I think what this represents is that even though limbo is not a terrible place, it's not a hellacious place, but there is no hope of anything better. Um, and certainly for Dante, you are you cut off from the presence of God, uh, which is a kind of hell in and of itself. But I do think Dante is grappling with a theological problem that Christians today ought to grapple with, regardless of what conclusions they come to. What do we say about all those thousands or millions of people who lived before the time of Christ? Or what do we say about all those people who lived after the time of Christ, but through no fault of their own, never heard the gospel, never embraced the gospel, never were baptized and, and part of the church. Um, are they going to be tortured eternally in hell? Or has God prepared a kind of fate for them that is somewhere between heaven and hell? So Dante, I think, is wrestling with that. But notice there is no hope for them. And I mention that not just because it's significant for limbo, but this is a, a guiding principle for Dante. Um, when we die, the moment we die, we are, in a very real sense, frozen. We remain who we are at the moment of death um, for all eternity. Um, so, you know, there's no hope that the gospel is going to be preached to Virgil and Homer and that they'll get to leave limbo and, and follow Dante on into paradise. No. Um, we, we, we remain who we are when we die. Finally, the other group that doesn't quite fit the three-part the three part scheme are the heretics. The heretics are found in circle six of the Inferno. Um, 
in case you're a little fuzzy on sort of the notion of heresy, just know that heresy is um, any sort of conscious deviation from church teaching. So in order to be a heretic, you have to know what the church teaches and then consciously make the choice to go against it, to believe something else, to teach something else, so on. Um, now, it's interesting to note where the heretics are located. And Dante has a, you know, a great kind of organizing, classifying mind. So he's not just going to sort of put the heretics in some random spot. He puts them right between um, uh, the sins of anger and the sins of violence. Okay? Sins of anger in circle five, sins of violence circle seven. Right between them are the heretics. And uh, I, I think perhaps the suggestion is that heresy is a kind of act of violence against the church. Um, that's, I think, at least one possible way of, of explaining that. Uh, now, the particular heresy that Dante has in mind here is Epicureanism, E-P-I-C-U-R-E-A-N-I-S-M. Epicureanism, which is an ancient heresy, and I think the aspect, or the the, the um, yeah, the aspect of Epicureanism that Dante is really has in mind here is that Epicureans did not believe there was any kind of meaningful life after death. Okay. So we die, and yeah, there are gods, but the gods don't really care about us, and uh, we become worm food, and that's basically it. Um, so um, now I think that for Dante, these particular heretics are symbolic of a whole, you know, galaxy of heresies. There's, there's dozens, of scores of heresies out there. Um, so just because Dante chooses this particular one doesn't mean he's only interested in that particular one. But that particular heresy that he has in mind does make sense of the punishment. So again, reciprocal punishment. What is the punishment for these heretics? Well, basically, they are sort of bound in these red-hot iron tombs for all of eternity. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense, right? During life, these heretics believed that there was no life beyond the tomb. So what is their punishment? For all eternity, they are confined to their tomb. Uh, so again, it's another good example of how, for Dante, um, these punishments that Dante, the character, sees in hell, these are not necessarily punishments that are only inflicted on the sinner after he dies. But remember what I said in the previous video, sin contains its own punishment. To believe that there is no life after death, that in itself is a kind of punishment that one begins to bear even excuse me even in life uh, one last thing and then I'm done I want you to notice that when you get to uh, circle six um, that something kind of strange happens uh, there are two characters that you meet uh, Farinata and Cavalcanti Cavalcanti is the father of Dante's good friend Guido Cavalcanti whom he had to banish from the city. You remember me mentioning that. Um, one thing that's interesting to observe is that Farinata and Cavalcanti, so they're both heretics, they're both punished in this circle of hell, they seem to be completely oblivious to one another. Right? So they're both kind of talking to Dante, but they don't seem to hear each other. They don't, there doesn't seem to be any real interaction between the two. And this is something I want you to be looking for as we descend with Dante further into um, the Inferno. And this is going to be something I'll talk about at greater length in the next video. One, uh, our, one facet of the nature of sin that Dante explores in the Inferno is the way that sin breaks down and destroys community. And I think the further down we go into the Inferno, uh, the clearer that will become to the point where we get to the very last circle, circle nine, Cocytus, and what we will find there is a total breakdown of community. So more on that next video.